Warning, the radio broadcast you're about to hear was made by men and for men. It may at times seem a little rough around the edges, brash, and certainly not canonically approved by papal authority. But its content may indeed challenge you to become the man, father, husband God has called you to be. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to another week of The Obligation. My name is Jason Murphy. So glad you are here. We are going to continue our Instagram interview series. Uh, We've had a great couple of weeks uh, getting in touch with some Catholics around our country, telling their story, telling their reversion, their conversion stories, um, talking about their uh, transition to the traditional Latin Mass and some of the issues going on uh, around them in their parishes, in their dioceses. And uh, kind of, you know, putting uh, putting Catholics together and, you know, letting us uh, kind of get together and, and hear more. Not that we want to talk only about the bad going on, but, you know, just to kind of hear what some of the struggles are, because uh, we do have strength in numbers and we know that iron sharpens iron. And even sometimes, even if if those uh, those interviews, they, they by chance might be female, well, their iron needs sharpened as well. Uh, We are going to be talking to someone today coming from New Jersey as well, Uh, actually friends of the Tattooed Trad Catholic, someone we had on a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Carolyn and I uh, had a great talk. Uh, We discussed her reversion, uh, her story, her faith walk, and her finding the traditional Latin Mass through the fraternity of St. Peter. So without further ado, I want to bring on my next interviewee. Uh, good guy, young guy, uh, proud to say, very proud of him uh, for being you know, one of the younger guys we've spoken to and had on the show. And knowing that he's 18 years old, far more advanced than I was when I was 18 years old. So it's always good to see a, a young guy moving in the right direction, digging into his faith. Uh, so glad to have Alex Greco. Alex, welcome to The Obligation. How are you doing today, Thank my man? Thank you for having me here today. I, I'm doing good, you know. Woke up after a great night talking to my local parish, my parish father, Boyd, and some other kids at the youth group I'm getting involved in at the FSSP. You know, took my classes in the morning, got my free time to pray the rosary, as I do every day. That's awesome, man. To hear a young guy, you know, talking about praying the rosary, that was the last thing on my list. And I'm I'm just proud to to hear you say as that that is one of the first things on your list, you know, attending mass and going out of your way to serve our Lord. Uh, such a, such a great uh, breath of fresh air to hear these days. Cause that is, um, that is not much you would hear from an average uh, 18 year old, you know, 17 year old, 20 year old, uh, 50 year old, you know, unfortunately we've been talking about that, you know, we've been talking about it and, you know, you mentioned the rosary. Uh, I remember talking to the tattooed trad Catholic and uh, you know, I, I, I accused her of being an extremist, a Catholic extremist. And I asked, I said, well, Carolyn, do you have your rosary wrapped around your AR-15? And she said, my rosary is my AR-15. So uh, I know I stay locked and loaded, and I know you do too. Of course I do. That's right. The world's Um, full of evil. It's bad. It is bad, you know, but thanks to God, we uh, we have we have uh, our Lord and our lady to guide us and show us that light. Um, and I think I mentioned to you before we came on the show today, um, speaking of the rosary, I'm going to be talking to someone out of Illinois next week. Her parish under Cardinal Cupid, uh, you know, his direction is uh, disallowing the public recitation of of the rosary and they've threatened to remove masses if they continue to pray the rosary after mass. They said it's a distraction. The priests there have said it's a distraction to them and, um, and it needs to cease. What do you think about that? That's wrong for a number of reasons. I mean, Padre Pio, St. Padre Pio said himself that it is essential that we pray the rosary and we recite it often to show the mother of God that we love her. And coincidentally, it's a shame that this popped up that I was just told about this on the nativity of the Blessed Virgin. Oh, which is amen, a, which brother. Is today, yeah. right? Yeah, you're right. You're right. The rosary is a beautiful thing to say in a group. I was at, I was at uh, the youth group I was saying, you know, last night, and we all prayed the rosary. 
we did an entire rosary and we did a uh, laity, I believe, or a litany, litany to uh, to Saint Joseph oh. as well. And you know, it's crazy how they want to not let us pray in the sanctity of a church, which is supposed to be open to all. That's right. Yeah, we we talked when I was talking to her. I said, you know, it's kind of funny. You know, they mentioned a distraction, but the only people that remaining behind after mass were the faithful who want to pray the rosary. So I'm, you know, who are they distracting? You know, it's because the people who, you know, number one, if you're going to a six fifteen a.m. mass, come on, you're obviously taking your faith pretty serious. You know, and I highly exactly. doubt, I highly doubt anybody attending a six fifteen a.m. mass is going to have a problem with someone saying the rosary. So that sounds like there's a something coming from the top down, sludging down the hill uh, is what it sounds like. It smells like to me. Well, yeah, we have the issues with the bishops in America and archbishops too, which are allowing, you know, people, as we all know in the catechism, abortion is a mortal sin and could be warranted with excommunication. And we have bishops saying it's okay for those in that state of mortal sin and in a state of where they could be excommunicated to receive communion, which is endorsing sin. The world is just coming to a, a, a crazy, crazy point, especially with Catholicism and the bishops and everything going on in the West. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting. You know, I spoke about it a couple of weeks ago, too. You know, it's almost, you know, the way the conservatives are portrayed by the liberals in our politics is very similar to the way the traditional mass, not even traditional mass. I would just say traditional Catholics as a whole, because not all those adhering to traditional Catholic observances or, or, you know, practices, uh, you know, are, are ones that maybe are, are attending the traditional Latin mass because the traditional Latin mass is, is very difficult to get to. It's, it's few and far between parishes actually have it. Uh, you have to travel great distances sometimes. Um, so I think this is, this is starting to become a, just a full fledged attack on traditional values, um, on both sides of the coin, you know, on the political realm, the secular realm, and in our in our church. And it's not just the Catholic Church. I mean, you're seeing even even um, you know devout Christians and the faithful Christians with traditional values. They're they're being persecuted as well. Um, so let's shift gears. Let's talk a little bit about family life growing up. Um, you know, how was that? You know, how how were things as far as practicing your faith? You were brought up Catholic. You know, I was, was brought that? up a Novus Ordo Catholic. Right. I had a discussion with my father this morning about receiving Eucharist by hand and Eucharistic ministers saying like, you know, yes, they say it's okay, but here is also why it's not okay. And the response I got for basic things like the fact that that's still the body of Christ through, you know, the, the sacrifice and the, the miracle of the Eucharist, right, which we were taught. Oh, it was Jesus, but we were taught to receive on the hand, and it was only brought to my attention that receiving on the hand could leave residue or crumbs, and that desecrates the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And priests, ordained ministers, should only be the ones, you know, handling that, right? Because it, it's something so sacred that they offer up a sacrifice for us, and we should be receiving, you know. I mean, growing up Novus Ordo, I didn't know all this, right? Mm -hmm. And I kind of st st uh, steered away for a second in my morning conversation. But that's because my, my parents were all nor Novus Ordo Catholics. They didn't know anything other than the priests trying to entertain the mass, giving their little homily, like making jokes about their personal life rather than leading towards, you know, leading towards God. They were like pandering towards the crowd. Mm -hmm. it, so that also was what I believe made me leave the faith when I was like 15, because I'm like, okay, there has to be something bigger. But when I came back, back to Novus Ordo, but with, you know, better informed and better, you know, better informed and I guess armed with knowledge, right? Sure. I went sure. and I really started taking the readings to heart and I started taking the mass seriously. And then I realized that maybe this isn't for me. And I, I looked into orthodoxy, but then I realized that they don't believe in immaculate conception, believe it or not. They don't believe that the Blessed Mother, the Theotokos, is free of original sin or yeah. free of a virgin that's i had this talk last night too with uh, my father boyd yeah but then i discovered latin mass through tattooed trad cat because she's like oh there's a latin mass you know right down the street right down the street from you so did you have any I experience or know anything about that prior to 
No, I didn't know much about it. We actually discussed making sure I was, like, you know, if I really wanted to do this, because I was doing the Novus Ordo Mass regularly for a year after my, you know, reversion or conversion, whatever we want to call it, from Gnosticism back to the faith. Mm. And then I decided that Tridentine Rite and TLM was the right for me because it's just so reverent and so divine. I mean, you can't tell me that there isn't something special about Latin Mass over the Novus Ordo Mass. That's right. Yeah, it's it's very apparent. I mean, my reversion came through the traditional Latin Mass. Uh, I was I was just a mess. You know, I've talked about that many times. Um, and I walked in after not going to church for many years and having no faith to walking into that little chapel and knowing something, something otherworldly, something holy, something, you know, something I needed was there. And I changed my life I, every, every Sunday afterwards. So um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a surprise. It's nothing new. We're hearing that more and more. Um, people want more. The faithful want more. Those who want to practice want more. And they're seeing through the shenanigans. They're seeing through the abuses. They're seeing through um, this 1960s uh, attempt to encapsulate some sort of modern idea of what church and faith should be. And it's failing. It's failing. It's failed. I don't even want to say it's failing. It has failed. You know, there's there's no arguing that. And um, you know, the folks that are faithful in the in the in the Novus Ordo uh, tend to lean towards the things that are associated with the traditional Latin Mass. You know, the the faithful Catholics who actually are trying and may not be aware of the traditional Latin Mass, they're drawn to the solemnity. They're drawn to the churches that have the communion rails, that encourage communion on the tongue, that have incense, Mm -hmm. have Gregorian chant. Um, And you're seeing those parishes above and beyond your average Novus Ordo parish, and even more so the traditional Latin Mass, the attendance there and the belief. Um, so, so, you know, coming from Novus Ordo, um, were you guys at mass on every Sunday or was it kind of nominal? How did that? I went from, you know, we have the joke that, you know, like the sun, not the every Sunday, but the holiday Catholics, right? Like, oh, you'll be there Easter and Christmas and maybe a few Palm Sunday, or, cause you or, get something yeah. on Palm Sunday. Everybody's got to go on oh, Palm, yeah, Sunday. Palm Sunday too. And, and Ash, Ash Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. You gotta get ashes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh. The issue was I can never find a mass that works for me there for confession. They only did it Saturdays at 5 p.m. Mm-hmm. and I work all day on Saturdays. And I think that my Novus Ordo old church that I left, and I think most of Novus Ordo churches do this too. Like they're not enrolling people in the scapular. And that's just one of the other things. I think they also do confessions either really early in the morning or at night or maybe like once every night at a reasonable hour for anybody who's working a nine to five or working, you know, somewhat decent hours or going to school, but during like Holy week or during Lent, but after that, it's just back to like, well, for me, Saturdays, you know, at five o'clock, which maybe not everybody's free on a Saturday. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, um, you know, what do you, what are you doing? A, you know, 18 year old, you mentioned doing some beekeeping, you mentioned school, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, what, what you do, you know, when you're, when you're not at church and not praying the rosary. Well, I go to a Dominican college, Caldwell University, okay. that was founded in 1939 by the Dominican sisters. Really nice little campus. I like it. I go to the chapel every day and I pray the rosary or I say prayers and, you know, I, I pray for people who need it. I take prayer requests too. And I pray for those who need it. Never for myself, but always those who need it, you know, because everybody should be cared for by God. And yeah, I do beekeep on the side up every few weeks up in New York with a nice guy, Jerry. And, you know, I learned a bit about that. And the funniest part is Valentine's day. While we think of it as the day to like give somebody like a heart card, St. Valentine's the patron saint of beekeepers. Did you know that? I did not know that. Neither did father Boyd. So like, on Valentine's Day, now what, I, what I'm going to do this year, too, is like, happy bee day or something like that, like, you know, just because the patron saint, patron saint of bees, beekeepers. So have you gotten bees. into uh, any any um, beeswax candles? Because I know those are used in the liturgy. Uh, have you gotten there yet? Beeswa- Here's the thing with beeswax. You can make it, but it's very, very difficult to make because after you get rid of the honey and the comb, you could process the comb. 
but the comb does have stuff like wood and one so it goes on purity there's like second and first grade and stuff and it takes a lot of time to process you can make mm. them you can make these wax candles out of the lower quality and they'll work but will they look i guess i could say aesthetically I think as that long is. as they're 51%, I think that's what the qualification is. They've got to be at least 51% beeswax, I think, is is kind of the, the liturgical guidelines. And, you know, even on um, the Paschal um, Vigil, they many there are some prayers that uh, incorporate for the bees that made the candle. Um, I don't know if you've, you've heard that, but, you know, but even in the prayers of the, the, the vigil, Easter vigil, uh, they mentioned the bees and and their work to you know to work together to build the the comb that put that builds the candle and uh, provides the light of Christ at Easter. So it's very interesting. So that, I think that's uh, pretty ironic. There, a guy super involved with his faith and also doing a little beekeeping there. Um, so tell me a little bit because we talked the other day. We're, you're not eating pizza anymore. So tell everybody out there about this, about what's going on with the pizza. I think this is this is phenomenal. I love this story. Okay, so I got a confession for the first time in like years, which apparently is a church law that I never knew about. Because once again, the glorious Novus Ordo Mass, right? You know, I gotta love it. <laughs> so I go and I confess that sin among other sins that I didn't know or was not educated on because of Novus Ordo, like receiving Eucharist in a state of sin and not in a state of grace. Mm. Right? They didn't tell me that in Novus Ordo. They said receive Eucharist as often as you can because it's God, but they didn't say like go to confession before. Right. And it's a bunch of other things, but uh the penance was a rosary a day and give up something that you like eating so i gave up pizza because we all know pizza there's like a pizza place wherever you go you know yeah. it's convenient it's a matter of convenience so i gave up pizza. pizza come on exactly so i gave up pizza because i work in a, a pizzeria slash italian restaurant nice. and rather than get a meal cooked for me whenever the chefs aren't busy i used to go and get a slice of pizza and this would happen at least once every week when i worked so i gave up pizza and now i don't eat pizza anymore and i haven't for the past two months and i intend to keep that going for the rest of my life that's amazing as part of my wow. penance that is you know you don't you don't hear about people actively engaged in in regular penance anymore and that is beautiful that is really a beautiful thing to hear um you know hopefully you will offer up a piece for me uh, at some point in time you remember my poor soul and and not have that piece of pizza uh but if you do uh you know i'm sure you know uh, uh, god understands but uh, but i but that's, that's great i support you on that and uh you know, I think the the prayers there for you know whoever you're praying for the souls in purgatory for your for your own time in purgatory. I think that's a wonderful idea, and uh, God bless you for for doing such a thing. So I think we are coming up on our first break, so we are going to take a quick pause, and we'll be right back talking to Alex Greco uh, here on the obligation. Stay tuned. This is Jason Murphy for the Catholic Men's Conference of the Carolinas and the Obligation Radio Show here on the Carolina Catholic Media Network. Catholic Radio is live and on the air at AM 1270, broadcasting from Belmont, North Carolina to the Charlotte Regional Area. Carolina Catholic produces more local content than most Catholic radio stations across our country. Tune in on air, online, on demand, and anytime at www.carolinacatholic.com. Dot org. Make sure to catch the 2022 Catholic Men's Conference of the Carolinas replays each Saturday afternoon starting at 3 p.m. You can catch Keith Nestor, Tim Staples, Dr. Ray Garundi, our own Dr. John Aquaviva, and find out what the buzz is all about for the Catholic Men's Conference of the Carolinas. Also make sure to tune in to the featured men's shows on Carolina Catholic, Faith and Sport with Dr. John Aquaviva, airing on Mondays at 5 p.m. and on demand, The Remnant with Stephen Thomas, Bill Snyder, and Ray Haywood, airing on Saturdays at 5, and my show, The Obligation, which airs at 5 p.m. on Fridays. Catch all of these shows and more at AM 1270, on air, online, and over the app at www.carolinacatholic.org. Once again, this has been Jason Murphy. God bless and Esto Vir.
Did you know that 90% of older adults wish to stay in their home as they age? Aging in place has many benefits. It tends to improve quality of life, which in return improves physical health. Also, retaining independence as we age is critically important to our mental health. Hi, my name is Meredith Dignan, and I am the president of Harmony Home Solutions and an active parishioner of St. Patrick Cathedral. We are your trusted partner for aging in place. We strive to enhance the lives of older adults and their families by providing premier aging in place and universal design lifestyle solutions that increase safety beautifully. Now is the time to get your aging in place plan in order with Harmony Home Solutions. Visit our website today at hhsclt.com. Again, that's hhsclt.com. Or give us a call at 980-220-8821. Again, that's 980-220-8821. We want to help you live an empowered and beautiful life. And we're back. Thanks for sticking around. My name is Jason Murphy, sitting down today with my my young friend, my good man, Alex Greco. Uh, he was just telling us about his penance he's taken up um, you know, for, for a period of time, for maybe the rest of his life. Uh, not eating pizza. So uh, I think that's great. It sounds kind of funny, but I think it's very serious. He wasn't specific. So I just thought he implied for the rest of my life. And I mean, I feel better. I feel healthier with all, with, without all that stuff in me. Amazing. You know, you're gaining grace and, uh, and getting healthier, you know, I mean, what's better than that? So our Lord knows he rewards us in more ways than that we can even imagine. So I think it's great. I think uh, you rarely hear about anybody and anything about penance, um, except, you know, when we, when we get around, you know, Lent, you know, everybody talks about giving something up for Lent, but, um, but the, the, the common practice of, um, abstaining from something you really like for a long period of time on a regular basis, that is, uh, that is something traditional, Alex, that sounds like you're a, sort of a, an extremist there, a traditional extremist, you know, don't go so hard on yourself. And it's kind of offensive, you know. Don't you think the pizza guys want to want you to eat their pizza? Are you, are you offending them? Maybe I don't know. So. I don't know. All I know if it's an ex- if it's extreme to follow my orders given to me by a minister of the Lord, then call me an extremist. Amen. Sign us up. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your reversion. You know, so you were you were brought up Catholic. I, I was the same. Brought up Catholic in the Novus Ordo. Um, you know, back to your point real quick about, you know, receiving the Blessed Sacrament, you know, for the first time or as you got older, you know, there was never any instruction. And I'm, 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 a, you know, I was born in 74. So probably somewhere, you know, in the 80s, 83, 84, 85, something like that is probably when I received my first communion. And there was never any mention about being able to receive on the tongue, let alone kneeling. Um, it was just kind of, you know, this hand goes here and, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and that's unfortunate because I think we miss the mark on understanding truly what the blessed sacrament is, you know, when we don't, when we don't see it, you know, it's the Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi, you know, the way you pray, the way you, you know, worship is the way you believe. And, uh, so many Catholics, you know, they just, they pile into the line and those are the same Catholics that have never piled into a confessional line, at least, you know, probably not often enough. Uh, St. Paul says, you know, the just man sins seven times a day. Um, and, uh, you know, for, for anyone to assume and presume upon receiving without being properly prepared and, and obviously acknowledging or even being able to acknowledge, right? Like people don't even know what sin is anymore, do they? Exactly. Right? They're, like, exactly. They're like, well, it's not doing this exactly. It's doing something like it. So it's not a sin or, you know, they take something out of context that the Pope says and they're like, oh, see, like I had some guy who was an atheist start mocking me saying atheists go to heaven, atheists go to heaven because the Pope said it. But I read an actual article from an unbiased source and they just take the stuff out of context. I mean, anybody could take anything out of context and make it what they want. Right. So same applies with sin. They like, for example, Oh, you know, Leviticus 1822, it was man shall not lay with boy as man. It's about pedophiles, not about homosexuality, right? I know, controversial hot take, but if you look Mm. at the very first translations of the Bible, 
because stuff did get lost in translation, but the first translation from Latin to to English, the Dewey Rhymes, and if we're going to go back even farther, the Torah, Biblical Hebrew, it is man shall not lay with man. So people are finding any way, any nook and cranny, any possible le- leverage to change what is and isn't sin. And in that, in that, we live in lies and lies don't have truth. And you could live in the lies without knowing the truth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, my my children uh, have just recently, a couple of the middles have recently gone through their first confession and um, and received their first Holy Communion. And, um, you know, it was it was a good reflection to go through with them through the Ten Commandments, because we think, you know, based on, you know, modern Christianity or, you know, modern Catholicism, well, as long as we haven't killed anyone and we haven't, you know, broke, you know, we haven't stolen anything and we haven't gone after our neighbor's wife or husband, you know, we're probably good people, you know, we haven't done anything horrible things, but they don't, you don't really look at the fine details, you know, it's not, the, it's not just murdering the body, it's murdering of the reputation of someone, you know, um, and, and the stealing is not, you know, it's not just going to Walmart and stealing something off the shelf, it's, you know, it's taking, you know, uh, you know, not being honest with the, the wages of your employer, you know, not, not giving a, an honest day's work for, for honest day's wages and, and, you know, st- you know, stealing of ideas or whatever. There's so many, you could, you could meditate, you There's know, for so 20 much minutes. It's really- yeah. So it was like a good reflection so that they could really see the depth of them. Thanks. You know, thankfully we had a good uh, preparation uh, kind of uh, for them for their first confession, able to go through. And it's a good reminder for everyone. Um, you know, it's it's not just the big bright lights of the Ten Commandments. It's it's everything that goes into each one. I mean, you could meditate for 10, 15 minutes on each uh, each commandment for sure. So, um, so back to you know your story of, of of returning to faith. I know there was a time that in your life, and I think it revolved maybe around a diagnosis of diabetes, that you oh, began yeah. to kind of question. You know, how could God allow something like this to someone, you know, so young, so healthy? Um, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Exactly. It was like, you know, the entire atheist argument that we made the Jewish of, of something bad in the world. And it's like, see something bad. God, if God was real, he wouldn't want this. You know, I was very, it actually drew me to what I would like to coin a honeymoon phase where I was a devout in prayer and whatnot. But then after that, I kind of slipped into like, I wouldn't say a depression, but just, you know something questionable and then i hung around with some not questionable people but people who weren't exactly catholic like some guy was like very skeptic of the church and was like making up stuff like oh playing cards are done by gypsies and you guys you catholics didn't like gypsies so they're hypocrites and whatnot right you know classic anti-catholic rhetoric and that was the same guy who was like what if god's just one big being and and he appears to people like the Hindus and the Buddhists and the Muslims in their tr- cultures and traditions to make his appearance known to them. And what if every God is actually God, but just appearing in accordance with the customs of the locals and traditions. But the reason that's false is Buddha says, I do not know everything. Muhammad was a false prophet and he didn't really give an answer to much. And Judaism, well, it's a iffy because there's so much branches, but you know, I'm not really familiar with Torah. But Jesus himself said, I am salvation, right? Nobody in every other religion said, I am salvation, mm-hmm. or I am here to, I am going to sacrifice my life to save you, right? And that is how I, I learned that Jesus was the answer when I got out of that swoop and I started seeing more people on the internet when Catholicism was kind of making a trend again on the internet. Mm-hmm. And when I slipped back, I was one of those, I'm not, I'm not ashamed of it either. Actually, no, I'm ashamed of it, but I'm not ashamed to say, because it's easy, because it's best to admit where you were wrong than to live in arrogance your entire life. I was one mm-hmm. of those like LARPers, you know, like the LARP Catholics, like go to church or we need another crusade and stuff like that for a little bit when I was like 15 and 16. <laughs> when I met some guy who I lost, contact with also named alex and he kind of you know guided me through with the entire pope stuff and sspx and was like you know don't do sspx and the pope you know something's up with the pope and people are against him so read everything with the vine print because headlines deceive 
And then mm-hmm. after that, that's what got mm-hmm. me interested in going back to Novitz Ordo Church, where, as I previously stated, I listened to the actual liturgy and I listened to everything I meditated on that stuff and I thought about it. And that guy who was also Novitz Ordo, Alex, as I was talking about, and he, he's the one who kind of brought to my attention you can't receive Eucharist in a state of sin. You know, it took somebody else, not my own priest, but some guy who actually had to study this on his own, right? I mean, this one guy, if he, if he ever watches this, I want to thank him, right, for showing me all this. Because he's kind of what, like, started my fascination with the church culture. Like, he got me into Eastern Catholicism, too, like, showed me about that stuff because his dad was a Chaldean Catholic, believe it or not. And it's crazy how, like, the Catholic Church is so it varies and it's so beautiful as we were discussing before with the latin mass how it's not just novus ordo like we have these eastern rites we have it we even have an indian rite and a chinese rite and it's crazy yeah. right and that fascination is just astounding but i got kind of sidetracked there that's what yeah. I, I i learned the beauty you know like i learned this is the true way like this is the epist- like we are, have apostolic succession we believe in this stuff like the stuff that we believe in, like that Mary is the blessed virgin that God chose to not have original sin and to, and chose her to be the mother of God. Like no other religion quote unquote religion has that. Right. But we have a, we have God because our God is so, he's just so merciful. Hmm. We can never hmm. underestimate his mercy is what I always say to people. And he is so loving of his creatures that even though we sin, we still he still sent his only begotten son to shed his blood and to go through all that torture, through the whippings, the floggings, the crowning of thorns, carrying the sins of the world, all past, present, and future on that cross while he was beaten, mocked, spat on, and then mocked on his own deathbed, right? It's, it's crazy. Like, as you were talking about watching the Passion of the Christ, like, you know, like if you've I've watched it, it's a very moving like I it's, I don't cry that much, but when I do, it was one of the times I cried the most of my life was watching that and seeing all these things that what Jesus went through. Like it's right. like no other God has given anybody that love because it's deception. Yeah. Our God is honest and our God is loving. Absolutely. So whenever you started going back, so it was the, was the parish you were going back when you initially started with the, the Novus Ordo, was it more of a conservative parish? It was the same Novus Ordo. I should have specified on that. I was baptized in the parish and I still went even when I was a Gnostic okay. for the, you know, the, the, cause you know, the holiday Catholics. Sure. But when I started paying attention, as I said before, that's when I noticed all these things. Like when I listened to the word of the Lord, and the mm. gospels and the readings, wow. right? That's what really got me going and moved. And that's what's and alongside my friend. That's what got me like interested in all this stuff and learning all these things about the church. Yeah, that's, I mean, he, you know, listening to your story, I mean, you just, you can just as an observer, you know, just see how our Lord reached out to you, you know, he spoke to you and, I remember, um, you know, when I started going back, you know, when I was 21, 22 years old, you know, thanks, thanks be to God, you know, I found faith back through the traditional Latin mass, but there were, there were moments in that little chapel where I felt like the priest was I and me and only me and our Lord was speaking to me directly. And, you know, he, he just kind of, he's, he stuck his hand out and he pulled me up out of the, out of the out of the swine, <laughs> the swine herd that I was, that I was running in. And, and he, he got me paying attention to him and, you know, and, uh, and I feel like that, um, our Lord definitely singled you out. He, he went after you for a reason and, you know, and, and you're just continuing to grow. And, you know, as an 18 year old, you know, it's just so refreshing to hear someone so excited and engaged in their faith. You know, we just don't see that. We just don't see that unfortunately very often, um, especially these days. But, um, so, so you found your way, I guess, uh, you know, through the Novus Order, you felt being called to more. And then exactly. at, some, at some point you linked up with the tattooed trad cat. How did that, how did that happen? So and, and how did remember that Shammy? Yep, Shammy, Shammy, Shammy was on so, last week. That's right. We're all in the group Shammy chat. You're in the group chat too. But like way, way back in the summer when I first joined, they were talking about TLM and I was talking about Novus Ordo. And Tattoo Drag Cat's like, wait, you're up in Kinalon? And I'm like, yeah. She's like, oh, I'm down. 
down near Pompton. Like you're literally right up the road, like five minutes from me. Wow. Wow. And uh, she got me like interested and got me like, we scheduled a day where I could come and we go to mass together. Actually, we used to, at least I'm tr- we're trying to figure out like a new way we could go together. Cause it's nice having somebody, you know, at mass and, you know, during the Lord. And uh, we used to go every, like almost every Tuesday night when I was in town, other than that, I couldn't control finding a, that in mass or a mass when I'm out of town, because if I'm out of town, I'm busy, but I'd still pray my rosary and I still do all I could to be with the Lord. As I was taught, I work towards, making that an achievable goal and something that I do every Sunday. Right. But anyways, back to the story, I learned about it through her and we scheduled that day and I went there and, you know, something about seeing Christ on that altar and the silence. Right. And Mm -hmm. it wasn't the priest trying to like talk to us about how he went to the market the other day and how the cabbage falling with mold on it exploded. And it was like, it's like, it was like Jesus sacrificing himself for the greater good. Or something words, like that. In the, words, in the words of recent Shia LaBeouf, you know, you didn't feel like anybody was trying to sell you anything, right? Exactly. I just sat there and I felt something come on me. And whenever I go to a chapel, but specifically a, like an actual, like traditional, not like a modernist, but like a traditional chapel with like the architecture and the altar and all that stuff, you know, I just feel moved. Like I truly feel God there. Right. And I feel like when I sit down and I pray and I offer up my sins and I offer up my penance and I offer up, you know, a rosary for the souls in purgatory or somebody who needs the Lord, I'll offer up prayers, you know, the, the, the standard stuff. I feel close to God specifically when I'm in that church. Mm-hmm. Just because of the serenity, it's, it's, it's just so reverent, the Latin Mass. It's beautiful. You know, you don't, as I said, you're not being entertained. You're being led towards God. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's great. And I mean, that's that's kind of, you know, it kind of springs from the conversation that Shammy and I had um, last week, you know, talking about this kind of new model of evangelization through social media. Um, you know, uh, there's there's a lot, you know, there's a lot you can get involved with in social media. There's a lot on the Internet, you know, that's going to lead you astray. Um, but as Catholics, we Catholicize that, you know, which we have, the tools in which we have. And and right now, you know, we're we're talking, you know, you're up in in New Jersey, I'm down in North Carolina, you know, we're worlds apart per se. I mean, we're not too far apart, but I mean, we're able to have this conversation and, and talk about the faith and it's and through it's through social media, you know, and and there, we're seeing a movement of that. Man, there's a huge movement of Catholics you know, kind of, kind of coming together, you know, you've got, like you mentioned that this chat group, which is sort of a, a sub kind of a sub page or a sub group of, of Instagram, you know, followers and things where like-minded people can come together and share and question and help each other out in a, in a non-public way, in a sense, like you're not just going to get attacked by any, any, you know, crazy person out there because you mentioned something extreme like the rosary or our lady you know, it's or being a Catholic and the Baptist guy down the road starts screaming something about the papacy. That's right. That's right. So it's sort of a sort of a protected little group there. And it's man, it's encouraging people. It's uh, and, you know, for you to be introduced, you know, through that that little you know, group chat to the traditional Latin mass and, you know, it you know already being called by God, you know, in a sense, and now being able to hear him clear more clearly and see him more clearly because, you know, in the Novus Ordo church, sometimes you just unfortunately don't see God, you see man. And that's how it was set up. You know, they took the tabernacle out of the middle. They put the, the presider quote unquote chair in the middle and the tabernacle was shoved off to the side and the priest turned around and faced the faithful. And instead of receiving our Lord, you are now taking our Lord. You know, it's, um, the reversion of, of the focus there is just, um, it's, there's uh, there's so many so many pieces of that big puzzle. I've heard some stories about people taking the <laughs> taking the Eucharist home. I've yeah. heard some stories about that. Like just slipping just slipping in this, their pockets and taking it home. Like, what what's the special like? What is special about that? If you're just doing that, I mean, why? There's many questions we could ask, but for all you know, for time's sake here, like, why is this allowed in the first place? A lot is allowed. A whole lot is allowed that I don't think should be allowed. Um, 
And that's what these conversations are about, you know, bringing them to light, you know, hopefully these, these conversations, they fall on the right ears at some point. Maybe they fall on the ears of a, uh, of a priest who has some, of uh, some say, or, you know, maybe a heroic priest who says, you know what, I'm no longer going to do A, B, or C. And, you know, I've, I'm going to be, you know, abide by, you know, my faith in, in Christ and, and my duty as a priest to, uh, to protect the sacrament and to protect the faith. And, uh, you know, maybe there's, you know, bishops out there, you know, that maybe this will fall on, fall on the right ears where a courageous bishop will say, hey, we're going to, we're going to change this way. We're not going to follow these, these unorthodox uh, restrictions that are coming down from Rome that really have no basis. Novus Ordo, had it been, you know, like performed as it was intended to be, would have been beautiful. It yeah. would have been everything but just in English. Now, there were vernacular masses before Vatican II for Latin mass. It was just the Latin was used to read the liturgy, and it was still performed like what we see the traditional Latin mass where you are being led towards God. It was a time where you could speak your, your native tongue with the only exception of not understanding unless you understood some Latin was the liturgy, right? And after Vatican II, many mistakes were made with the Novus Ordo Mass to the point where nobody corrected them. Hmm. No, they were, they were made for so long when nobody corrected them to the point where they just became mainstream, per se. Like priests, you know, not leading towards God. Like you'll see in some Orthodox, like not Orthodox Church, but like Orthodox Novus Ordo, like traditional Novus Ordo, who will do how it, like who will do it as it was intended to be contrary to what we see every day yeah. where it's you know them saying oh you know it's okay you could do, this isn't a sin they, it was a mistranslation or this isn't you could do this or receive eucharist if you if if you didn't go to confession and just so many mistakes are made and they're not corrected yeah. i mean anybody knows with church laws that you cannot receive communion if you are in sin but they don't tell you this I think one would have to one would have to wonder after a certain period of time whether it's intentional or not uh, of, of the abuses and the allowance of them. I mean, if as a father, if I just allow my kids to go play in the street and they're always playing in the street and I know they're playing in the street and one of them gets hit by the car, one would have to wonder, did I allow that? You know, please, God, you know, that that will never happen. But. You know, if you don't do anything to correct a problem, then you are complicit in the problem. Oh, and, for sure. You know, um, I think we are coming up on our next break. Uh, stick around. We're going to hear the final segment with Alex here, and uh, we'll be right back. Hello, Carolina Catholic family. This is David Papandria, founder and chairman of Carolina Catholic Media. Please join us during our 2022 Catch the Spirit Pledge Drive season. Your pledge will help us better plan and allocate resources to evangelize the truth of Jesus Christ across our seven media platforms in the Carolinas. Every dollar raised goes back into the Carolina Catholic operating and capital expense budget to grow our apostolate. When you consider the state of the world and the extraordinary times that we're living in with a cancel culture, unprecedented media bias, mistruths and disinformation everywhere, it's clear why Carolina Catholic Media is here. Our mission is to communicate the truth of Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church to over 5 million souls in the Diocese of Charlotte and upstate South Carolina. With that comes a commitment to create diverse local programs from our parishes, schools and ministries. Our vision is to bring everyone together as one unified Carolina Catholic community. Carolina Catholic Media is a 501c3 nonprofit. Your financial gift is 100% tax deductible. To sponsor or donate, please email me at feedback at carolinacatholicradio.org or call me at 800-857-2909. That's 800-857-2909. We appreciate your prayerful consideration to support us during our Catch the Spirit Pledge Drive. May God bless you abundantly.
Welcome back to The Obligation. Sitting down today with Alex Greco. Alex is uh, part of our Instagram interview series as we continue to dig in across the country and hear from you know, our fellow Catholics that are, you know, about their conversion story, their reversion stories, uh, issues going on in the parishes or dioceses around them, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly. We're here to cover it all. Uh, Alex, uh, I got to say, I've said it all, all afternoon here. Super proud of you. You know, a, just such a such a breath of fresh air to hear from a, a young guy like yourself who is, you know, really taking it upon himself to dig deep into the faith, to learn not just to learn, but also to evangelize, because that's what we're called to, right? We're not called to just take it all and keep it to ourselves. Uh, we are called to share that with others. And man, you're, do, you're doing pretty good with that as well. The key to sharing is to not go about saying, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this, and like beat people pretty much. You, you're told, you're called, I forgot you said it, but you're called to be a good example of a Catholic to show others yeah. by your actions that this is what... The faith makes you makes you into right? right so being a good right. example of a catholic and bettering yourself will lead to the conversion of others as long as well as long uh, as well as your prayers and efforts to evangel uh, evangelize absolutely yeah you can't give what you don't have but uh but once you have it we're called to give it <laughs> so you know our lord definitely ex ex expects us you know like those talents you know we're not expected to, to receive those talents and bury them in the ground. We are called to uh, to go and, and reproduce them and and share them and and grow them. Um, and you know that's uh, and this world of certainly needs those talents spread. You know the the talents of faith and hope and love. Uh, we are certainly lacking in all three departments all over the board. Um, you know, so we've we talked about you know kind of how you, you got back. Uh, to practicing your faith, you long for more. You know, our Lord delivered. He uh, he put you in contact with the tattoo tried cat, and you guys, you know, started you know attending as as much as you're able the traditional Latin mass. You know, obviously there's some very beautiful and distinct differences between. But um, to your point, you were mentioning um, if you look at the Novus Ordo, the way it was really supposed to be prescribed after Vatican II. If you look at, you know, with, with it being out, ad orientum, you know, the priest facing away from the people and facing towards the sacrifice, the, the cross, and, um, you know, in in Latin and no communion in the hands and, and all of the things we've talked about so many times. You know, if you were to look at them side by side, the untrained eye would really not be able to see much difference between the two. So one has to ask themselves why, you know, if they were so, so much the same you know, obviously with the Novus Ordo, they removed many of the prayers and the genuflections and, and things like that. But if you were to, you know, basically set them aside in a, in, a, in a split screen, you'd really have a tough time. Most Catholics would have a tough time. And so that just, that begs the question. You know, that's one thing I think many Catholics ask, why would they do it in the first place? But I think we know that there were, there were reasons behind what they did to leave it open for interpretation, to allow things to take place that were not supposed to be allowed. And now here we are down the road and we have a substantial amount of damage done due to that fact. You know, what, what do you, what do you think about that? You know, why do you think, why do you think Vatican II was formed? You know, do you think there was, you know, there was maybe good intention and it was just misunderstood or do you think maybe there were, there were things that needed to be addressed, but we all know that the Masons and you could call me a crazy conspiracy theorist mm -hmm. extremist, but we all know that the Masons, if you read the ritual, calls to worship the grand architect and to make a blood sacrifice that if you somebody down your line ever breaks that sacrifice you all suffer in their equivalent of damnation and we all know that the masons don't like the catholic church and that they're strongly opposed to our organized religion that's right and we know through documents that they've tried to infiltrate the church and we know that people can infiltrate the church and we know that there are fake priests, as it says so in the Bible, that people could become priests but be fake. But it's up to us to know our stuff and to read our Bibles and to read and to know this, right? And to the untrained eye, as you said, they look similar, right? But the trained people, like me and you, Jason, we, we see this. We see, like, we've read gospel or we follow people who we follow the right resources. You know, God bless social media for that reason that sources become readily accessible and, you know, communication from, 
this part of the world to that part of the world could be fast so other people could see these things, right? So Vatican II had some issues, but it was still a valid council as per the papacy. Anything else would mean we would be in schism with the Holy See and not be Catholics. But the issue here is infiltration of the church. As John Paul II said, the smoke of Satan has entered the church. And Paul VI, I believe it, yeah. yeah. Paul the Sixth. it was one of the Pauls. Yeah. There's, there's so many popes. But it was a very, it. very, very strong statement for sure. Very strong exactly. statement. Exactly. And pe people, you can't, that came from the Pope himself. And people are like, oh, but the church is infallible and the church is this. And, you know, it can't be because Satan is destined to lose. Yeah, in Revelation, Satan is destined to lose. And in, in fact, doesn't even get the chance. We give him so much more power through modern culture than he actually has. I mean, he's easily defeated by St. Michael the Archangel, right? That's right? But he preys on those with strong faith and those who are uneducated and those who follow. He can corrupt a priest or he can corrupt a bishop. And people who blindly follow and don't know their catechism, don't know their dogma, will fall victim, sadly, to deception. That's how the devil works. Yeah, no, it's it's true. We uh, we we certainly, you know, take a look at uh, Mass of the Ages. You know, this documentary that's been put together so masterfully put together. Um, they've had two episodes have come out. The third is coming out soon. Uh, it paints a very clear picture, a very factual uh, picture of of the reasonings behind it. You know, no one wants to see that. It's not pretty. You know, we don't want to think that there was corruption in our church. No one wants to believe that. Our Lord didn't want to believe that. I mean, it was part of his salvation story to have the Judas, you know, story involved in there as well. But I'm certainly sure, you know, that is not something, you know, our Lord wants to see uh, his church suffer. Our Lord does not want to see the corruption there, just like we don't. But unfortunately. Oh, he knew it for sure. Yeah. Look at Revel I've, I picked up my Bible and started reading Revelations, and I'm seeing and putting things together. How the, I think it was a church in Smyrna was one thing, but they were practicing another or doing something. And John called them out on it. Well, the angel in the Revelation that John had said, send these letters to the angel of this, to the angel of this church, and I know of your wrongdoings and change it, or, you know, bad, bad things happen. So I certainly don't have any doubt that that could happen to our church too. And things do have to change. Yeah. That's the issue. People don't read the scripture. They just follow what they're told blindly. Right. And they fall for the easiest of things. That's very true. I mean, what do you, what are your, you know, as a single guy out there, um, you know, young guy, what do you see from your peers you know, young men, is, do you know anyone else that's really out there practicing their faith, struggling? Or are you able to have fellowship with other guys and say, hey, you know, I'm going through this? Or, you know, what do you guys think about that? Um, what are your what are your what's your opinion on that? Uh, uh, fellowship is definitely key because strength in numbers and a collective gives the individual a sense of belonging, which will then make it more, you know, more it will make it more desirable to stay there as well nobody wants to be the lone wolf or the, the lone outsider the black sheep right so it's important that we stick together while welcoming others and showing them community and me being the the lone like the lone catholic i know a guy says he's a lone catholic but everything he does is not that catholic and we tell him like you know you gotta step up your game we, we care about you man but like stealing this thunder when I say this a little bit, I'm the lone Catholic out of my friend, out of like my friend group in college. I've had to make friends and network and they're really nice people, but they're not all Catholic. And, you know, I don't have much fellowship. I have one, I think, but he's Novus Ordo. And what the joy of my chapel brings is we're such, it's, it's so small. It's not like a mega church to where everybody knows each other. Like I met three nice people, Harold and other Alex. And then, Eric last night, who were, you know, in their early 20s, mid 20s, and me being 18, I was a bit younger, but they're still not that much older than me, and they're going to Latin Mass, and we were having a good discussion last night. In fact, it was me and Alex talking to Father Boyd about, you know, the persecution of Catholics and Eastern Orthodox in the 19th and 20th centuries in wars like the Cristero War, the Spanish Civil War, 
the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, and all that stuff. And even with the Muslims in the East back with the Crusades, how they were persecuting Christians after they took their lands. So it's very good to have a sense of collective because that only strengthens the, it just strengthens, you know, your solidarity with both your faith and the the practice, uh, the practitioners of that faith or the the parishioners, whatever term you want to use there, right? Like it's easier to stand together and say, this is our God against the mob of left, of leftist Satanists and all that stuff and say, we are one and we are not going to tolerate this evil than just one person alone. It's still iconic, but you know, that's really all it is. You're just one man. Well, Alex, it has been a true pleasure having you on. Um, I think we're coming up on our time, but uh, again, I can't say it uh, enough how proud I am of you, you know, out in this world, you know, fighting the good fight. Uh, you have given a great testimony to so many out there. And, uh, you know, if, if people want to find you on Instagram, what would be the best way to find you? If they want to they want to jump on there and follow along, or maybe they have a prayer request that uh, you can uh, offer up some of that pizza for. Oh, yeah, I'll take it. It's alex.greco56. That's my handle on Instagram. You know, if I'm also friends with Shammy Strasig. Give him a follow, too. Tattooed Shred Cat. I mostly don't make my own original content. I don't got the time nor do I have the skills to, but those two accounts are very good with that. And they're very good friends of mine. And I share their content a lot. You'll probably see it on my story here and there. Yeah. Well, that's great. You know, I, I see here you have uh, Jack of all trades and master of none, but the, you know, the second part of that is still better than a master of one. So I, uh, I consider myself a Jack of all trades as well. And, uh, you know, keep, keep working at it and, uh, you know, keep, keep fighting the good fight and, uh, our Lord, you know, he is, he's there with you. And, uh, man, I just, I can't thank you enough for coming on the obligation. And, uh, I definitely look forward to following you and, uh, maybe speaking soon here about, uh, the next chapter. So of course, can I just make one more statement? Absolutely. Don't be afraid of your faith. You know, People have been told time and time again, rescind your faith or we will beat you or rescind your faith, you will kill you. It doesn't matter what people say. Do not be proud of your faith. God, do not, do not, you know, deny God like what Peter did because you will regret it. You will feel bad about it and you can be forgiven, but it is better to be proud of your faith and know your flaws and know your strengths and know yourself and your God than it is to deny any of that. Just be honest, be yourself. That's a virtue in and of itself of being a devout Catholic. Amen, brother. Beautiful words. Thanks for tuning into The Obligation. We will talk to you next week. God bless and esto vir. If you enjoyed this episode and have any questions or comments or would like to come on the show and discuss your faith walk or any issue regarding the Catholic Church, send us an email at feedback at theobligationshow.com. You can also catch all of our previous episodes and all of the shows of Carolina Catholic Media at www.carolinacatholic.org. Click that donate button and we'd greatly appreciate it. There are also many opportunities to sponsor the show, the radio station, and the Catholic Men's Conference. Join Census Fidelium, Harmony Home Solutions, and Wallach Investments who have pledged their funds to help keep Catholic radio on the air and relevant. Sensus Fidelium is a collection of Catholic homilies, apologetic videos, and other resources to grow in one true faith. They can be found online at www.sensusfidelium.com. Wallach Investment LLC is a strategic moral investing firm committed to placing their clients' interests ahead of their own. Their mission is to be a force of good in their relationships to make the most of their clients' investment, giving them the time and confidence to pursue their mission. Contact Daniel Wallach at www.wallachinvestments.com for more information. For the Obligation Radio Show, the Catholic Men's Commerce of the Carolinas, and the Carolina Media Network, my name is Jason Murphy. God bless and esto vivo.